All right. Uh, this is uh, Eric Daly from Miller Johnston. I am a uh, partner in our corporate and business uh, law section. Thank you again for joining us for another in our COVID-19 webinar series. Today, we'll be talking about um, updates across a number of small business funding programs, um, in particular, focusing on uh, the newest, newest program, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which was signed into law uh, yesterday as part of the general enactment of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And that's really um, gonna be the focus of our upcoming webinars and was the focus of our first webinar related to the American Rescue Plan or the ARP as, as I'll call it, as we have more acronyms and shorthand now than ever before it seems. Uh, my, my partner Trip Vanderwall yesterday presented on some employee benefits related issues specifically COBRA subsidies and impacts on the Affordable Care Act under under the ARP. Uh, today, as I said, we'll be talking more about small business funding programs. And, you know, as it seems we're moving into a new phase of the COVID experience, um, it, you know, our content will shift with that on the webinars. Our, our overall philosophy, however, will will be the same, and that'll be to work with community members, whether they're clients or other organizations, um, other professional service providers, um, public public servants, collectively to make sure that you know we're positioning our clients and their communities as best as possible to uh, emerge from this pandemic um, and get back to hopefully something better than than normal before. So not even just getting back to normal, but emerging stronger and, and, and coming back and having a revived sense of community. So um, with that lofty ambition, we'll, we'll get into today's program um, regarding small business funding. And uh, as always, there's a bit of a disclaimer. Uh, I think many clients are participating, but please follow up if you have specific questions. This is more generalized information. And, and for those who are not clients, um, you can feel free to reach out and we can talk about if there are ways that Miller Johnson can be helpful for your particular situation. In terms of the agenda for today, I won't go through this in a great amount of detail. You can see these are the typical alphabet soup of updates, CPP, EIDL, Shuttered Venue Grants, or SVOG. And then the new program there, uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, that we will spend more time on. And uh, that's a new one, although we've had a sense of what the terms um, would look like since the House first passed the, the initial version of the ARP uh, a couple of weeks ago, and really before that, because that, that legislation has been sort of floating around in one form or another for, for a while now, and now it's lost. Uh, then we'll we'll wrap up after talking about uh, a revised program, the state small business credit initiative, which we won't spend a ton of time on, but um, briefly briefly uh, touch on before ending. And as always, feel free to um, enter any questions or or comments in the the chat feature. This whole program and the PowerPoint uh, slides will be available afterward, uh, as always. Uh, so I won't I won't spend much time on this. Uh, you probably saw already that yesterday the president signed into law the American Rescue Plan. You can see sort of the, the history uh, leading up to its enactment into law yesterday, starting with the House uh, passing it on a, I think, uh, well, it was a party line vote. There were a couple of Democrats who, who didn't vote for it initially. Uh, back at the end of February, and then an amended version through the Senate that, that dropped the minimum wage provisions and changed the uh, supplemental unemployment benefits, among other 
more marginal changes to different aspects of the law. Uh, and then the House earlier this week on March 10th approved the updated Senate version, which then yesterday was signed into law. From the small business perspective, the, the big picture takeaway is, is basically that the dollar amount of small business specific appropriations is really much lower than in the CARES Act, which is approaching its one year anniversary. Um, I think March 27th will be one year since the CARES Act was signed into law. Um, there, I think if you tally everything, you know, for small businesses, depending on how you count it, you end up with somewhere in the range of 50 to $60 billion in, in the ARP, which is obviously still a lot of money, um, but it's, it's, you know, meaningfully less um, than, than the CARES Act included. And, and much of that is because there was so much appropriated for the Paycheck Protection Program in 2020, and the the demand for those loans, based on the current eligibility criteria, at least, has tapered off. And so um, there was much, much less appropriated to that. And then, uh, as we'll talk about, the major area where there, there was a new program, the, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, uh, was not, you know, on the same order of magnitude as the PPP. So speaking of the PPP, big picture, there were no kind of major structural changes to the program. And there was no statutory extension of the current March 31st deadline. So right now, March 31st is the last day that uh, a lender can originate a PPP loan. Um, there's been some talks from SBA on their webinars and outreach about possible administrative workarounds to that because many, well, a number of large banks at least have either said they're not going to be implementing the latest SBA uh, rule changes. For example, the, the rule change that allows sole proprietors to draw a loan based on gross income uh, rather than net income uh, from their Schedule C. Um, some, some have said they're just stop, they're stopping the intake of new PPP applications altogether because the backlog of pending applications is so great at this point that they want to make sure that they can actually get all those processed before March 31st. Um, in light of that, there are, there are now reports, um, I don't, I don't claim to have any inside information on this, so I'm just reporting what what others have in the media that there are there are deals in the House and now maybe in the Senate, according to Senator Susan Collins, to extend the PPP deadline by two months for applying and then adding an additional 30 days after that to allow banks and SBA to finish processing those applications. So it's looking probable that that March 31st deadline will get pushed out again. Whether it happens before March 31st, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know why they didn't just include this extension in the ARP. It was a bit of a head scratcher for me, to be honest, because it seemed obvious to everybody um, that this was going to be necessary, given some of the delays in rolling out other programs that that interact with the PPP and given the kind of late breaking sole proprietor rules along with some of the, the, the other initiatives from the Biden administration to pause applications by larger borrowers for a couple of weeks. So it wasn't ultimately included in the ARP, um, but it looks like it will probably be extended at, at some point. And, um, if they didn't extend it, I would I would think, and even if they do extend it, there will likely be money left on the table, so to speak, in terms of the current appropriations. Um, that notwithstanding, there was an additional $7.25 billion appropriated to uh, the PPP as part of the ARP. Um, so that's that's kind of where we are on the amount of funding. There's still a lot a lot of money available for PPP loans, and um, 
there's time right now to apply before the statutory deadline and like it's looking likely but we should wait until it's law of course that there will probably be an extension or some kind of administrative workaround to make sure that applications that get in before march 31st do in fact get processed if they're they're valid so setting that aside what does the arp actually do for ppp um it expands eligibility for certain not-for-profits so previously, only particular types of 501c entities were eligible. So like 501c3s, 501c6s, there are a couple of other 501c types that were eligible, in some cases subject to restrictions on lobbying and things like that. And now, now basically any kind of 501c entity that's a not-for-profit is eligible subject to certain lobbying activities um, and expenditure restrictions. And some not-for-profits um, may be eligible now that previously were considered too large because there's a, uh, a, a new avenue for eligibility for not-for-profits that, that accounts for Kind of a per location size test similar to that um that which restaurants and hotels can benefit under it's not exactly the same but um the kind of the bottom line is if, if you're a not-for-profit that was previously ineligible either because of the type of 501c entity you are or because um either for a first or second round loan, you were considered too large based on employee headcount, it's probably worth revisiting for a couple of reasons. One, that you may just be eligible under the new standard, but two, and talking with clients, um, you know, we found that headcounts have changed over the last year and in some cases, you know, dramatically. So it's worth revisiting if, um, if you haven't already taken out two um, PPP loans as a nonprofit, whether you're now eligible. And at first I thought this was probably going to be kind of limited, but in fact, you know, yesterday I had a phone call from a client and I, I think they actually will be eligible now for a second draw loan under, under this updated criteria, uh, whereas they would not have been before. So, um, again, worth double checking and revisiting if you're a not for profit. And then the other um, expanded category of eligible borrower is internet publishing organizations. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, in short, uh, the last update to the PPP in December under the Economic Aid Act expanded eligibility to include like newspaper and other media outlets that reported, that reported news. And um, within the scope of that, internet only publishers um, weren't weren't clearly included, and so these kind of digital only news outlets are now likely included as long as on a per location basis they don't blow through the um, employee headcount limitations. And um, as you can see, there's an additional certification for these entities that they have to say that they, the loan will be used to support the component of their business that, that supports local or regional news reporting. So it's really meant to support, uh, you know, uh, reporting out of, of news, especially during the, the pandemic to make sure that information is still flowing, I, I suppose is the, the rationale. Um, the major takeaway for all this on the PPP front is really, in my mind, that um, the ARP did not, you know, triple down on PPP. If you can think about last year, the CARES Act being a big bet on PPP, and then the various additional funding and authorization of a second draw loan being sort of a double down on that. There's not a, an equivalent to here in terms of a third round or a massive reinvestment in PPP. Um, it's more, you know, my takeaway is that subject to whatever extension might get put in place, you know, the PDP is likely to fade away in, in the months ahead. Um, but trying to predict things during the pandemic is maybe a fool's errand. So we'll, we'll see what comes of this all. But, but for now, anyway, there's not any uh, major 
game-changing news on the PPP unless you're a not-for-profit um, or an internet-only publishing organization. Okay, um, so moving on to economic injury disaster loans. Um, we'll do this quickly because I think it may not be the most relevant topic for many on the line, but there is an additional $15 billion appropriated under the ARP for targeted um, idle advances. And these idle or EIDL advances, some may remember, um, were the basically grants uh, for those eligible businesses who applied for these loans through SBA um, last year. And initially, the loan amount or the grant, excuse me, the advance amount, which was treated as a grant, was um, $10,000 per per eligible borrower. And then that kind of, as appropriations were scaled back uh, or became lower, that got scaled down and they were SBA limited to $1,000 per employee in some cases. In other cases, certain groups like um, agricultural businesses had a priority period. And it was a bit confusing for a while, still is confusing. But at the end of the year, 2020, um, 10, there was um, a large appropriation under the Economic Aid Act to kind of make sure that everybody who um, was in a more hard hit area or a lower income area who didn't get the full amount of their potential $10,000 idle advance was able to receive that um, kind of retroactively and the SBA would reach out to those eligible recipients who didn't receive the full amount. So what the ARP did is that of the 15 billion appropriated here, 10 billion is going toward completing that effort um, of, of outreach to those who didn't receive the amount that they were eligible for last year, assuming that they're in one of the priority groups and then five billion of that fifteen billion is for additional five thousand dollar idle advances targeting you know really small businesses, so ten or fewer employees that had an economic loss quote unquote of greater than fifty percent so for that second category the the ultra small kind of mom and pop businesses um, they'll be eligible for a potential additional five thousand dollar idle advance. Um, so that they may get in total 15,000 in those idle advances um, at the end of the day um, if they're if they're eligible and in those particular communities. Um, so that's that's really all I wanted to touch on in terms of the idle grants that's administered directly through SBA. So if you're if you're in that category of 10 or fewer employees, that's really the only circumstance where you're going to want to proactively track the SBA's idle website. Otherwise, again, SBA should be reaching out to you if you're eligible for that um, increased kind of true up amount for the first uh, idle advance that you may have been eligible for last year. Okay. Um, shuttered venue operator grants updates. This uh, program, the shuttered venue operator grant program was authorized uh, in December of 2020, uh, $15 billion program initially, ARP appropriates an additional $1.25 billion. So now it's a $16.25 billion program. Um, it's, it's coming together. Uh, if you're tracking it on the SBA website, there's now frequently asked questions that have been updated a few times. There are sample um, documents that will be required, or I should say there's a checklist of the types of documents that will be required, not a sample set of those documents, but sort of a preliminary checklist of the sorts of things that potential shuttered venues, so theaters, movie theaters, um, concert venues, um, those types of uh, museums in some cases, maybe zoos, the types of documents that those grant recipients should be pulling together in addition to getting registered through the federal uh, government's grant management system. 
Um, so the latest reporting that that I saw this morning, and I don't have, again, I don't have inside information on on whether this is accurate or not, is that they're thinking early April for the the date when SBA would actually begin to start accepting applications and making grants under the SDOG. So that's uh, more than that's about three months, right? Of uh, stand up time for this program, which was authorized again back in December and again had been kind of floating around um, in a different version uh, in a, a separate standalone piece of legislation called the Save Our Stages uh, Act. So SBA, this is entirely kind of uncharted waters for them to be administering grants directly on behalf of the federal government. So it's taking them longer than expected. And obviously their staff are, are spread pretty thin and they need to pull in experts and resources from other parts of the government to implement this type of grant program because it's totally different from what they've done in the past as a loan guarantor and in some cases, um, lender for disaster loans. So it's taken them longer than expected. One important additional substantive change in light of that is that um, entities that were likely pursue SBOG or shuttered venue operator grants um, were in a bind uh, until, re you know, until yesterday, I guess, because they, if they were also eligible for PPP and hadn't already gotten two loans, they they were in a predicament where they couldn't apply for a second or a first PPP loan after December 27th, when the SBOG program was enacted into law without making themselves ineligible to then receive a shuttered venue operator grant. So even if the PPP loan was you know, much lower in amount than the grant that they could receive if they had, if they applied for the PPP loan, that would make them ineligible to receive any amount of grant on the shuttered venue program. And so now under the ARP, that, that is, that has been changed so that those entities can now go ahead and get a PPP loan or a second PPP loan, even though it's after December 27th and it won't make them ineligible on that basis and instead of being ineligible the amount of that new ppp loan together with the amount of their original ppp loan will will merely reduce the amount of the SBOG grant that they're ultimately eligible to receive so putting that together with what we've already talked about and the current deadline of march 31st although it looks probable again that there will be an extension at some point of that date, but we can't say for certain that that will be the case. Um, SBOG eligible recipients should move quickly to get the information they need to assess whether they're eligible for a PPP loan or a second draw PPP loan, um, if, especially if they need the cash to kind of bridge them through to that whenever they launch the SBOG program, if it's early April or late March. That's an option now for for those theaters, uh, stages, concert venues, museums, and the like. Um, so that's an important change worth noting here. Um, and you should, you know, certainly continue to work with council and other advisors, accountants, to make sure that you don't inadvertently take a misstep that makes you ineligible for another program because although applying for the PPP will no longer be a problem. It could be a problem if, you know, if you apply for the shuttered venue program and you're also eligible potentially for the next program we're going to talk about, which is the new restaurant revitalization fund. And as the name suggests, this is a, a, a new, it's a new fund, a new grant program. It's very similar conceptually to the shuttered venue program, but this one is targeted at um, restaurants and bars uh, and the like. And uh, $28.6 billion was appropriated in the ARP for this program. Again, this will be administered by SBA. So um, another, another thing on SBA's to-do list is standing up uh, a restaurant revitalization fund. Um, and I, you know, I 
last, but I um, you got to empathize a little bit with just how much is being tossed on SBA's plate that they had never done before. And um, like like the SBOG, these are tax free grants, so the ARP does make that clear up front. Whereas with some of the other programs, you know, there was some doubt about whether, like in the PPP context, whether there might be some tax implications that were unanticipated. Um, I think in this case, um, it's, it's hopefully clear up front that, you know, it's meant to be tax free on, on the receipt and then, you know, uh, expenses are not jeopardized for deductibility just because of the, uh, the grant funding. Um, the, the main differences here compared to the SBOG are obviously who's eligible to receive it. Um, but then also the, how you calculate the grant amount uh, it's probably more it's more favorable for for restaurants um, almost almost certainly um, maybe not in all cases but in most cases probably going to be more favorable under the the restaurant revitalization fund and uh, that permitted uses and and sort of the prioritization framework for rollout are, are a little bit different um, the the amount of the grant for a restaurant that was already conducting business for full year 2019 is basically the decline in gross receipts in 2020 compared to 2019. So the amount of lost revenue or gross, gross receipts is slightly different than revenue, how SBA defines it, but largely that's the concept is the amount of lost revenue for the eligible recipient or gross receipts more specifically is, is gonna be the grant amount subject to a couple of caps that we'll get to on the next slide. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, the amount of the grant, similar to the SVOG grant, is going to be reduced by any previous PPP loans. So um, that'll have to you have to make sure you have that information available if you if you did receive a PPP loan before, so you can report it correctly if you're going to apply for one of these grants. And then there are special calculations for. Um, eligible grantees that started business, say, mid-year 2019, or even if they started in 2020. Um, unlike some of the other programs, I think eligibility here is going to be a little more, it's going to be a little broader for, for businesses that may have started even during the pandemic, for example. So that's another uh, important distinction compared to some of the other programs that kind of required existence early in 2020, this, this is a little bit broader. Okay, um, the grant cap that I referred to, the overall amount in total that a single eligible entity together with any affiliated businesses of that eligible entity is not, so the, the overall amount of the cap for all affiliated eligible recipients is $10 million in total. Um, and no individual location, physical location can account for more than $5 million of that. So if you just have one location, one massive location, right, that you're going to be capped at $5 million potentially. But if you have four or five, you know, medium-sized locations, each of which would be eligible on its own for, say, $4 million, you're going to be capped at 10 million in total, um, assuming they're all affiliated. And there's actually a just practitioner note here for you know the any attorneys or other professional advisors on the line. One thing to keep an eye on here is that the um, unlike the other SBA loan and grant programs that have been authorized so far, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund legislation actually provides for its own affiliated business definition. So you're not, in this case, you're not going back to the default SBA affiliation rules. You're looking at a specific definition to this program, which doesn't necessarily differ greatly from the standard criteria that the SBA has laid out um, for other programs or just as a general backdrop for all of its programs, but it is specific to this program. So just another wrinkle to be aware of. Um, and then in terms of eligible entities, um, obviously restaurants, but then, you know, maybe less count, less intuitively things like um, caterers, they might not know immediately that 
this is something that they're eligible for. Uh, bars, lounges, for those in Grand Rapids and Kalamazoo or in Detroit where we have offices, brew pubs, uh, you know, obviously very relevant for uh, the microbrew and, and brewing uh, industries in those cities. Tasting rooms, you know, we've got some wineries in, in Michigan uh, that that could be eligible uh, if they if they're licensed to have a, a a tasting room or a tap room something like that, and then there's a catch-all at the end for any any place of business uh, in which public or patrons assemble for the primary purpose of being served food or drink. So this is pretty broad uh, broad net. I'm sure there will be some guidance implementing that last bit about you know what is a primary purpose for for um, businesses where, you know, they provide food and drink, you know, maybe like through some kind of a concession operation, but whether that's really their primary purpose or not, uh, probably if there's not guidance, then that'll be something that, you know, we pontificate over in the coming months. But um, clearly uh, the intention of covering restaurants and bars and caterers and, and the like is, is evident. Okay. Um, even if you, so even if you qualify under that initial definition, there are some things that can make you ineligible for a uh, restaurant revitalization fund grant. And it's a pretty short list, at least initially. We'll see how it gets implemented and interpreted. But if you're a state or local government owned business, you're ineligible um, or operated business, I should say. I think probably on the theory that there's so much state and local government funding already under the ARP that, um, you know, those dollars are meant to, to kind of fund government operations and not, not this program. This program is for kind of private sector restaurants and bars. And then um, more, maybe more relevant, as of March 13th, 2020, the business cannot have owned or operated together with affiliated businesses more than 20 locations. And regardless of whether those locations do business under the same or multiple names. So let's say, you know, you're, um, you're a, an owner or franchisee, an operator of um, 10 10 restaurants under one chain across the state or region, 10 restaurants of another franchise, and then you have a couple of other kind of your own types of restaurants that you're going to have more than 20 physical locations, presumably. And now as I'm saying that, I, it makes me scratch my head about, <laughs> you know, you, you, you may have seen those places or they're like the combination Pizza Hut, KFC. Look, I don't know if that's one physical location or multiple physical locations, but that's the kind of thing that I suppose may come up throughout this. Like, what if you have one structure that has multiple restaurants in it or different menus and things like that? But big, big picture, setting aside those nuances, which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, big picture is if you have more than 20 locations, regardless of what name they operate under, if you, if, if they're affiliated, that's going to make them all uh, ineligible to receive um, a grant under this program meant for, for smaller operator owners. Um, and I guess there's, you know, really just helpful going through these webinars with people real time because you do think of additional things like, you know, what if a restaurant has a food truck in addition to a catering operation, you know, how do you count up all those things for this location test? And I don't have answers to that right now. Um, the more we talk about it, the more questions I have. Um, and I'm sure that SBA will take some time to answer some of those questions in advance, though probably not all of them. Um, and then moving on from that, uh, more clear cut, test for ineligibility. If you have a pending application for, or if you have received the grants under the SVOG program, the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant Program, then you'll be ineligible to apply for or receive the Restaurant Revitalization Funding Grant. So um, going back to that example of like concessions, 
right? If so, if you're a, a zoo or a museum, that's an eligible entity. And you also have like an on-site restaurant, um, for example, uh, unless you have different entities set up, uh, if they're all operated through one entity, that one entity is not going to be eligible to apply for both programs, even though arguably, you know, it conducts businesses that in, on their own would, would be eligible for both. Now, if, if they actually operate the, the restaurant in that hypothetical, like if they have an on-site restaurant that is separate from the museum, as an example, and operates independently through its own entity, that might be different. And, and the museum part might be eligible for an SVOG grant and the, the restaurant or concession area if it's operated through a different entity may be eligible for a restaurant revitalization fund grant. Um, so it's important, I think, to view those programs holistically when you're in those scenarios. Um, because there are limits under both programs, but as far as I can tell, unless SBA implements it differently through rulemaking, there are not limits across the programs. So like um, on prior web webinars, we've talked about the fact that the SVOG has a cap on the number of affiliates that can apply, and you're capped at five affiliated entities, each of which can get a grant potentially of up to $10 million. Going back to the example before, if, if if you had five or six, seven different entities that were kind of in a mixed case of being a shuttered venue, but also having some restaurant operations or, or concession operations, you know, you'd want to think about that holistically so that you're not, you know, if one of those entities is eligible for a restaurant revitalization fund, fund grant, you don't, you know, inadvertently reduce the overall amount that that could be um, eligible it could be eligible for under the shuttered venue program so um, again look before you leap uh, in applying for these programs subject to the caveat that now at least there's some clarity that PPP applications um, in, the, in this environment won't be disqualifying um for for applying for either of these programs they'll just reduce the amount of grant that you could ultimately get and then lastly um if the restaurant or the restaurant chain is majority owned or controlled by a publicly traded company um then then those are um ineligible recipients of the grants so uh public publicly traded company ownership will be disqualifying Okay, prioritization of the restaurant revitalization fund grants. Uh, in terms of set asides, five billion of the overall twenty-eight point six billion is set aside for um, eligible restaurant, bar, caterer recipients, and the like, with that had twenty nineteen gross receipts of less than five hundred thousand dollars. So. Uh, you know, I'm not in the restaurant industry day to day, but I'm, you know, I'm thinking that this is more of um, one or two locations, maybe smaller locations, or you know, uh, food truck operator, uh, or a combo of those types of things. Not not a large scale operator. And then the remaining 23.6 billion is available for funding, um, and the SBA administrator of the SBA can make grants available in a, and this is in the legislation in, a, in an equitable manner to eligible entities of different sizes based on gross receipts. And the SBA can take into account and make adjustments for the distribution of those funds based on demand. So however many applicants there are um, and based on the relative costs in different markets. Um, so, you know, it's a lot more expensive to operate in San Francisco or New York than it is in, um, you know, say Grand Rapids or Kalamazoo or somewhere even, you know, in a rural area potentially. And, you know, that may be a good thing ultimately, depending on how it gets implemented by SBA. You know, if they really work with their field offices, there could be, I could envision a scenario where these restaurant revitalization fund grants get implemented at more of a local level through SBA field offices 
working with local communities to make sure it's done in a way that takes account of local considerations. Whether that is how it ultimately gets done or not, I don't know. Uh, that would be my hope, is that the SBA would leverage the local insight of its field offices, but, but we'll see. Um, and then after a phase-in period, not specified, uh, the duration of that phase-in period is not specified in the law, the SBA can open up the RRF for the restaurant uh, revitalization fund grants to all eligible entities, regardless of size or gross receipts. That wouldn't mean that ineligible entities like publicly traded companies or entities with more than 20 locations would be eligible. It just means that there wouldn't be among those eligible entities that are eligible, there, there would no longer be um, a, a prioritization or phase in of um, the applications and they would just be processed in the order received at that point. Okay, and then lastly on the prioritization front, during the first 21 days of making these grant awards and who knows when that will be given that it's taken, you know, two and a half months, probably it'll end up being three, closer to three or more months before the shuttered venue program gets, op, uh, you know, fully operational. Um, during the first 21 days after this restaurant program becomes operational, the SBA shall prioritize, it's directed under the law, and must prioritize awarding grants to eligible entities that are small business concerns owned and controlled by women or veterans, or which are socially and economically disadvantaged small business concerns. And that's fine. I'm not going to, it would be a, probably a separate standalone webinar to delve into you know, what, what that means and how it's defined under existing SBA legislation and rulemaking. But, um, you know, if you're, if you're eligible to receive one of these grants, you're definitely going to want to analyze whether you're, you know, maybe clear cut, right. If you're a woman owned restaurant or a veteran owned restaurant, uh, probably take a little more consideration and thoughtfulness to see if you're in a socially or economically disadvantaged, uh, situation, that makes you eligible for the priority round. And I think that's really important to look into because just in talking with some people who do know more about, you know, the restaurant industry, I think there's a lot of skepticism about whether the amount of money that's been appropriated, you know, matches the, the likely demand here. Um, just, you know, given how massive that restaurant and bar industry is, um, and the number of eligible recipients that there are likely to be. So you'll definitely want to consider as this program gets rolled out, whether you have a good faith basis to, to be considered in one of those priority groups, and you're going to be required to certify that you are and probably need to show some documentation of why you are, um, if you are eligible to, to go ahead in one of those priority groups. Okay. Um, in terms of certifications for the ESPA, or excuse me, for the Restaurant Revitalization Fund program, it's very similar to the PPP in that you have to certify that the uncertainty of current economic conditions makes necessary the grant instead of the loan, because this is a grant program, the grant request to support ongoing operations. That's really the same test as for the PPP. So, um, again, would recommend that, especially for larger grant recipients that you start being mindful that you want to have a record um, of why why the grant is necessary to support ongoing operations, um, not just sort of based on prior losses, which will determine the amount of the grant, but on kind of prospective need and additional costs incurred over the last period of time during the pandemic. Um, create that record contemporaneously so that you're not putting it together after the fact if, if your grant gets audited or reviewed. And then I'll briefly just mention that under, it was interesting to note that under the law, the SBA administrator is given the power and authority to develop a separate registration system for these grants that kind of leverages existing restaurant industry business identifiers and information. Um, I think this is a reaction to standing up of the SVOG program where eligible recipients have to go through kind of a cookie cutter 
um, or non-tailored registration process to become grant eligible. That's been cumbersome, especially for smaller um, shuttered venues. So here, instead of that, it looks like SBA will maybe have a little more latitude to create a customized registration system to expedite these grants. Permissible uses of the restaurant revitalization fund grants. Um, it's really uh, broad. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time going through these because they're so broad. I can't, it's hard to envision a restaurant that or a, a bar or a caterer that wouldn't be able to use their grant amount in combination of these various permissible purposes. But things like payroll costs, and in this context, there's no statutory requirement that a minimum amount be spent on payroll costs like there is in the PPP area. Although I remind people that originally the SBA implemented the minimum payroll cost percentage through rulemaking and not through statute. Um, so, you know, I guess as we track the implementation of the restaurant revitalization fund, you know, we may see additional caveats to some of these things or minimum spend requirements theoretically implemented as an exercise of rulemaking authority. But at least under the statute, there's no minimum portion that you need to spend in any of these categories um, you can really use them for, for any combination under the statute of payroll costs, mortgage interest payments, rent, maintenance, utilities, supplies, and then you can see the rest, sick leave, operational expenses. And then there's a kind of a catch-all at the end that gives the SBA the power to determine other um, eligible expenses that are essential to maintaining the entity. So um, there could be more categories. And then um, again, hard to envision, but if the grant isn't fully used by the end of 2021, so if you just sit on the money or some, you know, maybe um, you decide not to reopen or something or to, or to significantly scale back your, your operations and you have leftover funds, then um, by the end of the 2021 or potentially a later date, if the SBA administrator decides to make, move this date out up to two years later, then any excess grant funds would need to be returned to the government. So it's a use it or lose it kind of thing. Um, and right now, the, the last date would be December 31st, 2021 for, for using the money, although that could get pushed back up to two years. So that's it. Uh, there's, I'm sure, more to come on the Restaurant Revitalization Fund in general as that gets implemented and SBA starts to use its SBOG experience to roll this program out. I'm sure there'll be more to come there, but um, hopefully that gives people a sense of what to expect and what kind of issues they may encounter as they think about whether they're eligible or not. Really quickly, um, this is not a near-term sort of funding program for small business, but it is something that'll be out there for a while, um, potentially through September 30th, 2030, as you can see at the bottom. But the state small business credit initiative, this is totally separate from the Small Business Administration. This is money that's appropriated to uh, support basically state and local uh, funding programs for small businesses. So the idea is this 10 billion that the federal government appropriates is used to sort of seed money to partner with private investors and local organizations that that show that they can leverage those federal dollars to promote more lending. So it kind of gets leveraged up into an additional amount of financing for small businesses over the longer term, sort of beyond the, beyond the sort of stopgap or initial period of, of these alphabet soup uh, programs like the PVP, the IDLE, the SVOG, the restaurant program. So this would be kind of longer term financing that would be um, promoted through some government participation through that $10 billion. So that I'm sure more to come on this, but just be aware that there's this backdrop of some additional funding uh, coming online for small businesses as well. So um, in, in starting to wrap up some lingering questions and issues, uh, you know, will the PPP end date be extended past March 31st? 
I mentioned this before, in light of what banks are doing, uh, especially the larger banks like Bank of America and Chase, in terms of starting to scale back their PPP programs, um, putting out public statements to that effect, saying that that's what they're going to have to do unless it's extended. And given that there's reporting in both chambers of Congress about extending it, um, it seems likely that it will be. But right now, the law is and the, the, the overall situation is that it's set to end on March 31st. And so, you know, I'd proceed on that basis until something actually gets signed into law otherwise. Um, for many existing PPP borrowers, they want to know when will SBA clear the backlog of loan forgiveness applications? And the, your guess is as good as mine on that one. Obviously, they're, uh, uh, they're, scrutinizing things. Um, some of it may be technical issues. Some of it may be that there's been a change in administration as well as you know, implementation efforts for these other programs and restarting PPP or a combination of all of that. But for whatever reason or reasons, there's still $90 billion of uh, last reporting um, of loans that are under review by SBA. And they, they've tried to assure people that doesn't mean that there's necessarily a substantive issue with their forgiveness request. And it's more SBA kind of saying, taking a mea culpa on that and saying, yeah, we, we know we're past the 90 day review period and we're doing our best. And they're just kind of asking for patience. But uh, for a lot of the very early borrowers, um, I know the patience is, is kind of reaching its end point. So hopefully we'll see some movement there, but I don't have any real good updates for people on that at the, the present time. And then things like we've already talked about, you know, when will SBA begin accepting the shuttered venue grant programs? When will they um, be able to launch the restaurant revitalization fund process? At least in the meantime, now the PPP is an option uh, potentially for those while they await the launch of those programs, assuming that they're eligible for the PPP. And then, um, there are other pieces of legislation floating around. Uh, my partner, CJ Schneider, on our, our Monday morning roundup earlier this week talked um, with uh, our associate, Elise Hildreth, about one of those, which is the GINS Act, which would be another SBA-administered grant program focused on gyms and fitness centers and the like, which did not get incorporated into the ARP, but but you know has some, as you would imagine, some significant lobbying clout behind it as being uh, another industry specific grant program. And, you know, if the FBA has to do that too, how much does that detract from getting the other programs up and getting things cleared out on the forgiveness front? And then um, maybe uh, kind of related, but of secondary importance is the ARP authorizes or appropriates uh, more than a hundred million dollars to SBA um, funding what's called a community uh, community navigator pilot program. And basically the idea here is um, to really invest on, by SBA to invest in human resources and other resources, both of its own and to fund um, uh, other entities, outside entities at the local level that can help eligible small businesses navigate, as the name would suggest, navigate all these programs and figure out what what they're eligible for and work their way through the process. So how quickly can that, can that get up and going in a, in a time frame that's actually meaningful? You know, if, if things start to reopen with the vaccine rolling out, um, or is that going to be more of a distraction in the near term versus something that, that actually helps during the pandemic versus more of a long-term effort? So um, I'll wrap up real quickly here. We've got a little bit of time left, five minutes it looks like, but, you know, as I mentioned, the SBA has more on its plate, you know, really by orders of magnitude than it ever has before. So I wouldn't expect things to move at warp speed. Um, if you know anybody, uh, uh, I say this a little bit tongue in cheek, but if you know people who, you know, have been out of work because of the pandemic and have any kind of experience in lending or underwriting or finance in general, I'm sure the SBA is going to be hiring people um, based on all the appropriations that they have and the amount of work that they have to do. And that includes the local field offices. So um, maybe just a, a plug for, 
for that um, because I'm sure they're going to need additional human resources. Uh, and as I said, you know, while all this is happening, a lot of a lot of borrowers are still waiting for SBA to clear off their loans from from this time last year, more or less, or at least 11 months ago. Um, so your best bet is, you know, as I do for better or worse, I've gotten in the habit of checking the SBA and Treasury websites at least, you know, in the morning and, and evening hours to see if anything new has popped up. Subscribe to the alerts from uh, SBA and Treasury websites. You can do it program specific as well uh, as just general updates. And then, you know, so some news alerts if you have Google News or some other kind of news alert service. Good to see what's going on. There are some other organizations out there that do a good job of putting out news releases when things change. And then um, you can keep attending our webinars. That's a good option. We'll try to keep people up to date, you know, as we have uh, as best we can, as we have throughout the last year, and uh, put out client updates as as relevant. So, um, with that said, I am going to and there's. There's a picture of me from a long time ago, pre-pandemic, um, without a beard. Um, you can contact me with any questions, of course. We've got a whole team of people who work on COVID issues. So if I'm not the right person, I'll get you connected to the right person. And with that, I'm going to look to see if there's any Q&A. Um, there's one question uh, about... Do you recommend a newly eligible nonprofit to wait on first round forgiveness request until after second round application for a loan? Oh, so I think the it's the it sounds like the question maybe uh, if a first round eligible newly eligible nonprofit is now eligible for a second round loan but hasn't submitted forgiveness request yet on the first loan, should they wait? Um, to submit for forgiveness on the first loan before applying for the second loan. And the answer to that would, I would say, you know, I'm, I'm going to play up to the lawyer stereotype here and say it kind of depends, but it depends on the size of the loan. If it's above $2 million and it's going to trigger this automatic review process, then you may want to go ahead and apply for the second round loan because you may not get the second round loan funded until after the review is completed. And as, as you know, the review process is way behind schedule. On the other hand, if you have doubts about whether you're eligible for forgiveness and you wouldn't want to take out the second loan unless you knew you were going to be forgiven on the first loan, uh, then you may want to wait until you get the first one forgiven so that you don't find yourself in a situation where you have um, two loans that are then not forgiven. So it kind of depends a little bit on you know your assessment of the likelihood that loan forgiveness is in peril for the first one. But if you're very confident about your need and how you spent the money, well, all you need to do to be eligible for that second loan is certify that you've used or will have used the first round funds before you um, before you uh, accept the second round loan. So uh, that's a good question and. In general, I would say um, if you're going to be reviewed, but you're confident you're going to get forgiveness, then just make sure that you've used or will have used all your first round funds before you apply for the second round. And with that, we are at nine, and I don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Um, thank you, everybody, for making time to join us, as always. There's a couple of uh, notes in the chat box with links to resources about upcoming webinars and other resources, um, if you can check out uh, as we wind down here. I, I really appreciate it on behalf of our whole COVID-19 team that people have continued to uh, engage with us and ask questions. It makes us better at our jobs and um, helps us anticipate needs of clients. So please do continue to reach out with those questions. And I want to thank our um, behind the scenes team at Miller Johnson, in particular, Amy Scro and Jeff Haywood um, on the marketing and IT sides for doing a great job in making all of this information available to our clients and, and to us as uh, attorneys. So with that, I hope uh, everybody has a great weekend and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking again soon. I hope you have a great day and uh, stay healthy. Thank you.